Okay. So we'll start with some uh, recap questions and answer any questions you have. And I will fin finish up the structure lecture and then we'll do the 20 minutes break, um, not break, break out sessions where you answer um, some of these practice problems. I hope you had a chance to look at them at least. And then we'll have um, a discussion each, well, I think I'm going to divide you into two groups. And then um, group one will answer the first question, and the other group will answer the second question. And then after 10 minutes, we will discuss all together as a group. So that's what we're going to do. And then I'll move on to the third topic, which is protein analysis. So that's kind of the layout of today. OK. So let's remember together what's the role of hydrophobic residues in the folding of a protein. Yes, Katie? It initiates the folding. How does it initiate the folding? Um, well, the hydrophobic portions are, don't let the water fill in by each other, so they start to go towards each other and then everything else. So exactly. So the hydrophobic residues, um, so let me just mark you really quickly here. Try to be here on time, ladies. OK. OK, here you go. Please, for participation. I just got Katie. So yes, so as Katie said, so hydrophobic residues tend to not like the water, so they will come together and forcing the protein uh, polypeptide chain to fold. And by doing so, when the protein residues or amino acid residue come together, uh, the water will be expelled out of the interior moiety. And by doing so, what kind of forces will form? Hydrogen bonding. So the hydrogen bonding will start forming, giving the, the secondary structure, the stability to the secondary structure. So that's kind of the second. Um, because water is expelled out, so now instead of doing, uh, having hydrogen bonding with the water molecule, there will be hydrogen bonding between the residues of the amino acids. OK. Between the residues of, of between the amino acid residues within the peptide chain. What about tertiary structure? If hydrogen bonding stabilizes secondary structure, what kind of forces stabilizes the tertiary structure? Yeah? Covalent bonding, like that's what I think. Covalent bonding is one, but the tertiary structure is stabilized by all of the molecular bonding. You can have hydrogen bonding as well, electrostatic or ionic interactions, van der Waals. Um, hydrophobic interactions, and also disulfide linkages. So all of these bonds actually contribute to the stabilization of the tertiary structure. What's enthalpy? It's when a system like absorbs or releases heat. Say that again? When a system absorbs or releases heat. Absorb or release? Absorb or release? Both, so it could be like hot different. It could be yes, but it's basically the energy contained. The energy contained in a, in a bonding. It can be released. Okay. <laughs> Entropy is the chaos. Once you break some bonds, you have free energy forming. So then the entropy, when, when the entropy goes up, then the delta G will be negative, and that's spontaneous denaturation. So basically, this is contained energy. This is chaos. OK, name the solvents that disrupt hydrogen bonding. <clears throat> huh? Uh, yeah, but solvents. What's that? Detergents. Detergents, urea, for example, and detergents such as SDS sodium dedosyl sulfate, they uh, disrupt hydrogen bonding. What about hydrophobic interactions? 
Yeah. Organic solvent. Organic solvent as and also detergent. So organic in the presence of organic solvent. Uh, the residues inside, the hydrophobic residues inside the moiety of the protein will tend now to be exposed to the solvent because now they like the organic solvent versus water. Um, so hydrophobic interactions will be disrupted. Disulfide linkages. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. BME, beta mercaptoethanol. Or any other reducing agent, really. Um, ionic interactions. What's that? Salt. Yeah, salt and pH changes extreme pHs and uh, high concentration of salt um, might result in breakage of ionic interactions because changes in pH you will end up having. A very high pH means you have uh, like charges, like ne negative charge. And low pH, you'll end up having like positive charges. Then you won't get the positive-negative interactions. And the salt, the presence of salt, will shield the charges on the protein. So that, let's say if you have an ACL, the sodium will react with a negatively charged group. As a, Chloride will react with a positively charged group, so shielding these charges, preventing them from interacting with each other. How does the free energy concept explain the folding of the protein? Okay. When it's linear, then there are a lot of potential to kind of like bonds to break, so that it tends to fold so that the free energy decreases. decreases. So you have, when you have that one linear chain, you have a lot of free energy, so which is a very unstable, uh, so it makes the molecule very unstable. So in order for the molecule to stabilize, these, the energy gets contained in bonds, and once the energy is contained in bond, the free energy is reduced, entropy is reduced, enthalpy is increased, you have a stable uh, molecule. So the folding is basically uh, once the protein residues or the amino acids within the protein start binding, then the whole structure is folding and containing the energy in the bonds. Okay, as you were reviewing, did you come up with any questions that we can discuss as a group? Yes, Nina? Which R groups have the most like steric hindrance on like, the molecule? So the the larger the larger the R group, the more steric hindrance is going to form. So okay. the less uh, the less flexibility in the bonding is going to be. That's one thing. So the large R group. Second, if you have proline, the proline it, it doesn't have any flexibility because the R group is actually linked covalently to the amine group. So the bond does does not no longer have any flexibility, and that's why we call it a secondary structure breaker, the proline. Okay, so the larger R groups will generate um, larger steric hindrance, preventing the the folding of the protein. Okay, what else? Um, when we were talking about chemical reactivity and quantified proteins, we talked about. Um, a blocked amino group? What does it mean for amino group to be blocked? Oh, okay. So that's a very good question. What does it mean for amine group to be blocked? So you have an amine group, and if you get any interaction via covalent linkage on that nitrogen per se, that's you block the amine group. So, just like so it's no longer inside the chain. Yeah. Okay. So that so it's no longer um, primary amine. It's it's linked. It's linked via covalent linkage. To something else, usually it's a sugar or a carbohydrate, reducing carbohydrate end. Good. What else did you come up with? I when we do these tests, does these reagents go and uh, disrupt the pressure structure? When we like do the what? OPA test or anything to yeah. quantify the means? 
does it uh, see only the what is on the surface, or does it go inside the protein and quantify the amines too? So there might be amines not on the surface, but also inside the structure. Potentially in the reaction, I believe that, that the structure of the protein opens up. I, yes, I have to review what kind of reagents. Do you remember who runs OPA in the lab? You run OPA? Did you run OPA? I have to look through the reagents that we use, but potentially the OPA should be able to detect, the method should be able to detect any free amine. That's why it's used to determine lysine, uh, blockage of lysine, mm -hmm. and lysine not necessarily is always on the surface. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It depends on the, uh, it has to be the carboxyamide group. So can I uh, just go back? Was it in this lecture? It wasn't in this lecture? I want to pull, that's a good question. I just want to pull the reaction um, to look at the structure. So here, carboxyamide group of glutamine. And what were you asking? Which amino acid? Aspergine. Aspergine. That's a good question. It is the exact same group. I wonder if it's specific to having two methoxy groups, methyl groups, versus one methyl group in the binding site of the, probably could be that, that reason. Yeah. OK. I'm sorry, can we repeat the question that was asked? Oh, she was asking about the, in transglutaminase, you have the amine group of the lysine and with the carboxyamide group of a glutamine. So carboxyamide group reacts here, and then you release ammonia, and then you form a covalent bond. Uh, glutamine has a carboxyamide, and also um, aspergine has it too. Here and here. So the speculation was because of the enzyme could be recognizing this versus recognizing here, given the only difference in this case is two metal groups versus one metal. OK, what other questions? Do you want to say questions about the practice problem? The practice problem you're going to discuss together, uh, yeah, later. Any other? general lecture questions. Okay, if you didn't have any today, make sure next time you have some. Okay. Let's finish up the structure and then we can uh, do the practice problems. So, moving on to the formation of a secondary structure going from a primary structure to secondary structure. So the different types of secondary structures, we have alpha helix, beta sheet, and also beta churn. So these are the common, common ones. And we have random coil. Random coil, which is not necessarily um, any particular form, um, does not take a particular form. So for alpha helix, you have this general uh, sequence of amino acids. So you have a polar, nonpolar, followed by two residues that are polar, 
followed by two residues that are nonpolar, and then it repeats, the sequence repeats. So this is kind of the general trend to form an alpha helix. But that doesn't mean that alpha helix doesn't form if you have a, a slightly different sequence. But in general, you have this particular sequence to form an alpha helix or a helical shape. And the hydrogen bonds that stabilizes these heli this helical shape is usually perpendicular, uh, not sorry, not perpendicular, parallel to the axis of the helix. So hydrogen bonds occur between residues in a parallel uh, formation to the center or to the axis. Within uh, one turn or one loop, you have about 3.6 residues. 3.6 residues, that means 3.6 amino acids, and about 13 atoms in one loop. The interior is occupied by hydrophobic groups. We already established that. And the exterior is occupied by hydrophilic. If you have high concentration of proline in your sequence, it's going to disrupt the secondary structure. So let's say you have an alpha helix, and then you end, at one point here you have a proline. It will, it will stop. But it won't form a helix anymore. It will be kind of a random coil, and then if there's no proline, and then you end up with similar sequence to this, then alpha helix format continues. So in casein, for example, it has high concentration of proline, so it doesn't have an alpha helix structure or a beta sheet structure. It has a random coil, given the high concentration of proline. So beta sheet. Uh, what you have here is an alternating polar nonpolar sequence. So when you have an alternating polar nonpolar sequence, you can potentially form a beta sheet. And beta sheet usually formed within the one um, within the one polypeptide. So let's say you have one polypeptide, it can form beta sheets. So it can form within and form hydrogen bonding perpendicular to the axis. And you can actually, when we are stacking proteins, when they're polymerizing with each other, such as in the formation of gluten network, you can also form beta sheet across different peptides. So you can have another here protein. forming a beta, sheet, a beta sheet with another molecule, two molecules forming beta sheet. So you can have within and across. So the beta sheet formation across different molecules is essential in the gluten network for stability of the gluten network. So the beta sheet formation has a role of stability in different uh, applications. <clears throat> so beta turn is literally the name implies turn. So it's turning, it's kind of the loop. And in here, uh, usually the turn involves four residues. And again, the uh, hydrogen body is particular to the axis. And there are some amino acids that are involved in beta turns, commonly involved in beta turns. And beta, beta sheets, depending on processing and in the presence of water, can convert from beta turn to beta, beta sheet, I mean to beta turn. It's an indication of structural change. Sometimes when we do FTIR, um, we can look at impact of processing 
on the secondary structure of the protein. So oftentimes we see that we start with a certain percentage of alpha helix, beta sheet, and random coil and beta turn. After processing, sometimes we see a lot of the alpha helix and beta sheet converting either to random coil or to beta turn. But also sometimes we have alpha helix converting to beta sheet as well. So there is um, interchange between the secondary structure depending on the processing conditions and the type of protein as well. Yeah. Keep these, this kind of general information, but when we start talking about different sources of protein and processing, I will remind you back to what we talked about interchanging between secondary structures. We'll give you more examples as we go. Okay? Yeah. So if the alpha helix is you said that they can turn into beta sheet for structural changes, but does that mean that the sequence of the amino acids have changed? No, not the sequence won't be changed, but the realignment of the molecule, the re you know unfolding and refolding, it will refold in a sense that you have uh, certain strands in a position where they can form beta sheets. Because the formation of beta sheet is within two different regions. So if you unfold the protein and they fold it, they're not the same two regions won't necessarily be next to each other again. Another region will be next to a, a different region. But it would still follow the polar, nonpolar polar? Yeah, because let's say there is a region of polar and nonpolar here, mm -hmm. and a region of polar and nonpolar here then the unfolding and defolding, these two regions might come together. So not the same amino acids that we're doing alpha okay. helix would necessarily become beta sheet. Okay. Yeah. It's just the unfolding and the rearrangement of the molecule in a particular position allows formation of beta sheet. Okay. So what I better say is that the alpha helix would be reduced on the expense of gaining in beta sheet. Or beta sheets will increase on the expense of alpha helix. Okay. Is one of the things better than other, more stable than other? Yes. Beta sheet is more stable than alpha helix. <laughs> so beta sheet is more thermally stable than alpha helix. Um, and when we cover serial proteins, I'll be talking about the difference, for example, why we cannot form a strong bread from corn versus wheat because of the structure of the protein and the formation of certain beta sheet structures uh, in the baking. Once you bake, it collapse, the corn bread. Yeah. OK. Um, so here's an example of two proteins where you have really high alpha helix, helix structure versus uh, beta sheet. So these arrows represent beta sheet in, in the protein structure. So beta globulin denatures at 75 degrees C, whereas whey albumin denatures at 64. So this is just to illustrate that different secondary structures have different thermal stability. So forming secondary structure is not the end of the protein structural formation. You still have some free energy that needs to be contained. So we go from secondary structure to formation of a tertiary structure. So a tertiary structure uh, usually is dictated by the function of, we've said that many times before, function of composition and sequence of amino acids. So based on the composition and sequence of amino acid, we might create additional bonds, hydrogen, disulfide, ionic, hydrophobic, to form your final tertiary structure, which could be an open structure or a globular structure. 
Casein is an open structure, and again, because of the high proline concentration, more than 17% of the amino acids in casein is proline. So you really don't have much of a secondary structure, and your tertiary structure, because you don't have that much flexibility of bending, it's mostly an open structure protein. So you don't have the hydrophobic residues hiding in the interior of the protein. It's mostly exposed on the surface along with hydrophilic groups, and that's what makes casein a natural emulsifier, because your hydrophobic residues are exposed on the surface. Um, whereas the globular uh, proteins, such as whey protein of beta lactoglobulin, you have mostly hydrophilic uh, residues on the surface, and your hydrophobic residues are on the interior. Now, mind you that plant proteins mostly are globular proteins, but they don't exist as uh, monomers usually. They exist in a quaternary structure. And quaternary structure meaning you have several polypeptides associated together in a stable format. Um, so this is quaternary structure. Example hemoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin is a quaternary structure with four polypeptides. The casein micelle is a quaternary structure with several caseins linked together in a stabilized form. We'll talk about that when we cover daily proteins. But in general, you have beta casein, alpha caseins are in the middle of the casein micelle with kappa casein on the surface. And that hairy-like structure is the glycosylated part of kappa casein that is negatively charged and maintains the stability of the micelle and milk. So, and the interactions in the middle is mostly hydrophobic and via calcium phosphate bridges. And that's what stabilizes the, the, the micelle. Um, I should have had a soy protein image here where soy protein is uh, a quaternary structure as well. It's structure of, let's say, uh, 12 polypeptides associated together via different interactions. Um, and usually plant protein has high percentage of hydrophobicity, so they don't really exist as a, as a monomer like the whey protein does. They would associate with each other via hydrophobic interactions and form a quaternary structure. So what the type of bonding that can stabilize a quaternary structure, it can be hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic. And like I said, when the percentage of hydrophobic residues is high, then you tend to have um, a, a degree of hydrophobicity that's stabilizing the quaternary structure. Electrostatic as well. And oftentimes, you also have disulfide linkages. Uh, that stabilizes a quaternary structure. And I'll give you examples for soy protein later on when I cover uh, that part as well. Are there bonds that you see like, more often? In What's that? Are there bonds that you would see more often in um, quaternary structures, or is it just like a random ratio? Of no, not a random ratio at all. That's a good question. It really depends on the protein. So in KCE, for example, the main forces are the calcium phosphate bridges that stabilizes, as well as hydrophobic interaction. So that is very unique to KCE. For a soy protein, for example, you have disulfide linkages, you have hydrogen bonding, and you have hydrophobic interactions. So it really depends on the composition of the protein. And uh, based on that, dictates what kind of interactions is going to stabilize the quaternary structure. Okay. So for the casein, the calcium phosphate bridges are electrostatic type of interaction. 
And also they have hydrophobic interactions because you have really high percentage of hydrophobicity, especially in beta casein. So a lot of beta casein is here, whereas kappa casein is mostly on the outside because it has high, um, a, a fragment that is very hydrophobic. So it really depends, that's what I was questioning, it really depends on the composition of the protein itself. And again, here I say it can be affected by pH and ionic strengths of the surrounding as well as temperature. When I talk about legume proteins, pea protein or soy protein, we'll see that they associate and dissociate uh, based on the pH and ionic strength of the system because that impacts these charges. And when the charges are different, then you form different types of bonding. You might reduce the ionic bonding and enhance hydrophobic interactions, for instance, or the other way around. Again, I'm giving you basic information, but later when I give you examples of particular proteins, everything will fall into place. Okay. So with uh, quaternary structures, we can have a globular structure, like the hemoglobin and soy protein. These are, for example, two examples of a globular quaternary structure. Whereas uh, collagen, animal protein, it is a fibrillar uh, structure or fibrous protein. And because it forms a fibrous type of protein because its amino acid composition is mostly hydrophilic. So it's like long strands, mostly forming alpha helix, kind of secondary structure. And these, the collagen in particular is a three, uh, three strands linked together and stabilized mostly by hydrogen bonding. There could be some disulfide uh, linkages stabilizing it, but it's mostly stabilized by hydrogen bonding, this, this form of quaternary structure. Um, so collagen is a twisted polype polypeptide chain, three chains that are twisted, whereas uh, the um, actin, it is a fibrous protein, but it is a linear aggregation of small globular proteins. So it forms kind of a fibrous structure. However, it is a compilation of small globular proteins aggregated in a linear fashion. Um, so this type of protein is mostly structural or structural, giving structure, uh, whereas globular proteins have different functionalities. In here, I'm giving you just one example. If enzymes, for majority of enzymes, are globular proteins. Okay. Um, composition of a protein. You have a homoprotein. That means it's only made up of amino acids. Whereas there are heteroproteins or conjugated proteins. One example is phosphorylated proteins. These are alpha and beta casein in milk are phosphorylated. There are glycoproteins such as kappa casein in the example of the mice, and then lipoprotein in egg yolk that are good emulsifiers. So amino acids, some of them carry charge. And depending on the composition of the, amino, of the amino acids in a protein, a protein will carry a net charge. So there are so many charges on a protein. There are negative charges and positive charges. And when you add them all up, you get a net charge. A lot of the proteins are usually negatively charged, but there are some proteins that are positively charged. Um, so the net negative or net positive really depends on the pH of the system, okay? So it depends on which 
environment these proteins are in, they can be zero net charge. All of the positives equal the negative, so you end up with a net zero charge. In this situation, when you have net zero charge, the proteins will fall out of solution, usually, uh, because you have high attraction between hydrophobic residues that are either on the surface or exposed due to denaturation. But when you have a net positive charge or a net negative charge, you tend this protein tends to interact with the aqueous media, with the water, and will not fall out of solution. So if we say that at the isoelectric point, um, if we assume that the pH of the isoelectric point is 7 or 6.8, so you have no net charge at that pH. As you decrease the pH, we are adding protons. So the protons are being picked up by the carboxyl groups on the protein. Then you end up having that positive charge. Because remember, you have the amine groups, they are positively charged. And your carboxyl group, when ionized, they're negatively charged. But when you titrate with an acid, what happens, or when you add acid protons, the carboxyl groups that are COO minus are picking up protons, so they are no longer ionized. So then the, the positive is from your amine group still there. So then the charge becomes net positive. The opposite is true. If we titrate with the base, what's happening here is your carboxyl group is already negative. It gave up its protons long ago. And then the amine groups will gradually give you its proton. Then you lose a positive charge, and then the net charge becomes negative. Okay. But this all depends on the composition of um, the amino acids in your protein. So this we talked about that when you have net negative or net positive charge, you have repulsive forces, more interaction with water. This is so much pH dependent and also salt dependent because salt can shield the charges. Can, well, we'll talk later about salting in and salting out phenomena. A little bit of a concentration or a small concentration of salt can actually add a charge load on your protein enhancing interaction with water, but a lot of salt can shield the charges on the protein and compete for water interaction, result in precipitation of the protein. Okay, so salt and pH plays a major role on the charge of the protein. So let's think about this for a second. If at, a, at close to neutral pH, what could be the net charge of a polypeptide that have five residues of lysine, four residues of arginine, six residues of aspartic acid, and seven residues of glutamic acid, and 11 residues of glycine? So think about it and give me an answer. You got an answer? What do you have? What? Negative four. Negative four? Yeah. Okay. So it's basically 
in, in this most simple way, you look at, at neutral pH, lysine will be positively charged, arginine will be positively charged. So I have nine pluses. And also at neutral pH, aspartic acid and glutamic acid will be negatively charged. So 6 and 7, that's 13, and 9. So 13 negatives and 9 positives, that's a 4 negative. And glycine has no charge at neutral pH, so it doesn't really matter. So here it's just to illustrate the idea that we, we need to determine net that negative charge and that positive charge is really dependent on the composition of the amino acids you have and the pH. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is divide you guys split in half. I think we have six and six today. So turn turn your tables around here. So Katie and just Jason and Dave and Pam and Aditi and Lisa and then the six of you turn around. Um, we'll have you answer together question number one. And you answer together the question number two. So take 10 minutes to come up with answers, and then one representative will share answers with the class. Or not necessarily one, anybody in the group. Be prepared to draw a structure on the board.
natural lines like the shapes of the rainbow. And then the last one, which is the sure.
question on it all? Or can we ask questions now? You can ask questions. Yeah, you can ask questions. Go ahead. What's the question? I feel like I want to ask Heidi first. Yeah, you have a good answer. What's that question? That's the first thing.
So are you done, group one? Last question. Last question? Are we doing group two? Where are you at? Yes, B. B. Are you guys done, group one? Yeah. So what group two is looking, still working? Think about question two as well. Yeah. Yeah, I would say group one, think about group, uh, question C and D, E. These are short answers while group two figure out B. No, they would react with, not necessarily with each other, though. These amino acids, what type of reactions would they do if they were adjacent to something else? So any other amino acids? Yeah.
uh, you should be quicker than this a little bit. <laughs> Imagine the same question on the test. <laughs> Infinite time? <laughs> For the test? Yeah, why not? You remind me of the, have you seen that commercial, the insurance guy, and the girl wants more money from her insurance, and he pops up with a fishing pole and goes, I got you one, but it's got to be quicker than that. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. <laughs> Jason must, must know this commercial. <laughs> Okay, let's see what you have. We'll start with group one. Okay, you don't have to draw the structure on the board, I lied. Just draw it on your sheet. Um, yeah, who, who, who is the designated speaker? Mm -hmm. uh, Nina? <laughs> okay, Nina. Should I describe how I drew it? No, uh, oh. just, um, <laughs> no, I meant, don't worry about the drawing. Okay. Go f to the next question. Oh. Yeah. Okay. To the characteristics. Yeah. So the four that we decided on, we talked about the, um, the angle, so yeah. like partial double bond. Yes. Um, Very good. The second one was the sequence and the length. Yeah. The third one was the R group. Yes. And the fourth one was the cis and the trans configuration. Um, so I guess for our group in this trans configuration, we talked about how, um, so for the R group, if they were larger, there would be more stair hindrance, which will impact how it bends and folds. Uh, so similar to like cis and trans, um, we'll get stair hindrance and then also affecting how it like bends and folds. Um, and then the sequence and the length, um, we talked about like if it's like a longer sequence or if it's um, if it's longer, there's more molecular weight, which will make it um, less soluble. Um, so that's part of the reactivity. Um, and then for the minimal rotational freedom, that's going to come from the partial double bond. And so that creates like an interchangeable single and double bond, which I guess we didn't really talk about how that like. Yeah, the one thing that. You touched on a lot of correct terms. The one thing that wasn't really uh, very accurate is the length of what was the length of what? Um, we talked about the sequence of what? Sequence of what? Um, I guess the amino acid. Well, the question is. List four characteristics of this peptide bond. So the the just the one peptide bond, not necessarily how big is the okay. sequence. So everything else is right on. So you talked about partial double bond. Um, so the partial double bond um, this gives you the potentially the the fixed angle of the omega angle, uh, which limits the rotation. And that's why the peptide bond, this lies in a plane. Um, the other one was the, the, the two other angles, the phi and the psi. So these are theoretically, they have rotational freedom, but they are dependent on the R group composition, the steric hindrance from the R group. And um, yeah, there's the cis and trans configuration, which you were right about that as well. And then it is a planar region. So the, this peptide bond lies in a plan, in a kind of a planar uh, region. <coughs> So makes the secondary and tertiary structure have regional alignment, basically. Okay. 
I heard a lot of discussion about B. Do you have any questions? Second group? No. Yes, Lisa? Would you have accepted anything about like how the bond is formed? Like it's a condensation reaction, so it's a really stable bond. It takes a lot of energy to break it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But that kind of answering question be a little bit. Okay. But it is correct. I would accept it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I heard a lot of the Delta G discussion from group one. So tell me what you came up with. Nobody wants to volunteer. <laughs> So basically what we, well, we have so many questions. What we came up with is that based on the wording of the question, the delta G being negative for hydrolysis is not enough because there's not enough free energy to break the enthalpy of the peptide bond. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. So in general, delta G for hydro hydrolysis, generally speaking, is negative because the product has less free energy than the reactant. So that is in general. But in this case, it's the equilibrium constant is so high. Um, so once a peptide is formed, it contains so much energy that it takes a lot of energy to actually break it. and. Uh, and so its equilibrium is rarely reached in this case under physiological conditions. That means without any, um, anything that will lower the activation energy. So under just regular physiological conditions, the rate of the hydrolysis is very, very slow. Equilibrium is rarely reached. Um, and the equilibrium constant is high. Okay. So what about C? Is it high or low conformational freedom? High. high. Why is that? Because there's less steric hindrance. There are less steric hindrance. Lysine basically has H, and uh, alanine has only one methox meth methyl group, right? So it's very, uh, very high conformation of freedom. Very low steric hindrance. That was easy. <laughs> okay, group two. You don't have to draw it, draw it on your own. Um, so tell me what you came up with in terms of expected structure, secondary structure. Um, well, the order of Uh, which didn't perfectly match any of the things we talked about, and there's a proline in there. Yeah. Um, and we noticed that three of them were the beta turn, commonly beta turn. So we thought it might be that. It would be random coil. Given that you have a proline, which is a secondary structure breaker, so you're right about not forming alpha helix or beta sheet, not necessarily beta turn either because of proline being there, limiting the flexibility of any turns or bending. Okay, did you get to B at all? Did you at least start that? Okay, what did you come up with? What would cysteine form? What type of bonding would cysteine form? What specifically? Oh, Disulfide. Okay. So it will link to another? Cysteine. Yes. What would be disrupting agent? Yeah. Okay. What about aspargine? Uh, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Aspargine is um, mostly can form hydrogen bonding with any neighboring 
amine group or carboxyl or hydroxyl groups. Disrupting urea detergents. Okay, what about proline? Hydrophobic. hydrophobic. With any hydrophobic group adjacent to it, either aliphatic or aromatic. So disrupting? Mm -hmm. Huh? Okay. Yes, and in terms of solvent? Mm -hmm. Organic solvents and detergent. Uh, arginine then? Electrostatic, um, anything, any ionized group, uh, carboxyl or, um, yeah, carboxyl, that of aspartic acid, for example. So disrupting salt or high or low pH. Serine, hydrogen bonding, again, the same, any neighboring, the same as aspartame, really. Okay, so C, who got to C? Do you remember the two amino acids that could potentially be phosphorylated? The hydroxyl groups of serine or thionine. In this case, we have serine, right? So it's a covalent bond, and it's specifically a phosphoester bond. Okay, D. No. No, why not? None of them are phenolic, aromatic amino acid. Correct. Would this oligopeptide be cleaved by plasmin enzyme? Where? No. It would be cleaved. Plasmin is specific to arginine and histidine. Uh, lysine, sorry. Arginine and lysine. So after the carboxyl group of arginine, it would cleave. All right. Well, put it all together and turn it in next week for extra credit. Do you think this exercise is beneficial to do that in the class with each other? Yes. Okay, good. All right. New topic. A lot of what we do in protein research and protein in industry, we have to do analysis. <laughs> the analysis of protein, in terms of analysis, that means actual quantification of protein content or purification and isolation or structural characterization um, and identification of the protein. So all of these analyses that we're gonna talk about are relevant in many applications, whether in a, in a lab, in a research on protein, like I said, or in an ingredient company that's focusing on, plant, on protein ingredients, or if in an industry formulating with proteins. So this is very applicable um, topic to talk about. Okay. So, which of the following chromatographic technique can be used to separate or isolate protein in a solution? G. All of the above. So we can separate protein based on size, and I think, Bidi, you're doing that, right? Mm -hmm. you, huh? I'm using a PD Two in a row? What? What are you using? Tell me why. Yeah. 
That's yeah. also Yes. Okay. So size exclusion, we're separating based on the size of the protein, the molecular size and molecular configuration of the protein, anion exchange or cation exchange, depending on uh, the protein of interest and its net charge at a particular pH. So you can separate the protein from um, uh, different components using ion exchange. One uh, company, now it's Agroport, it used to be Davisco, they use uh, ion exchange to produce whey protein isolate. And their protein isolate is very unique and have different characteristics than the protein isolate that's produced by membrane filtration. So in industry, they do use ion exchange chromatography to isolate and purify. But for example, using ion exchange chromatography to produce whey protein has higher beta-lactoglobulin and less alpha-lactalbumin than membrane-produced WPI. Also, it has uh, less lactose than a membrane WPI would. Uh, affinity chromatography, um, it's based on, it's a very specific chromatography, so it's based on a very unique uh, interactions so it's often can be used to purify a very specific type of protein. So you can use antigens, uh, antibodies, basically, on your column to select for a particular protein um, to purify. Or enzyme. If you are purifying enzyme, you can put an enzyme inhibitor as a functional group on the column to uh, capture the enzyme and isolate it, purify it from the rest. Okay. So which of the following can be used to determine, elucidate, or not necessarily identify structural structure of a protein? Good guess. Yeah? A. Just A. Just A. ELISA and Western blood, these are immunoassays for identification of a detection the presence of. You can also use to quantitate as well. But when we say structure, it has to do with composition, it has to do with sequence, it has to do with uh, uh, molecular size, it has to do with secondary structure. Can ELISA tell you the structure if it shows that it's Present, like it bound to this, which means the structure is present. Well, you don't know which structure though. It's not. It's not telling you. Um, the ident doesn't give you the identity. I know you're talking about epitope binding to an antibody. It doesn't tell you what's in that epitope. It just tells you it's present or not present. Doesn't it match to a particular? It matches to a particular epitope, but it doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you, um, it doesn't give you any information on that epitope other than it's present or not present. It doesn't give you a molecular size, it doesn't give you the amino acids. It doesn't give you a sequence, yeah. No, but you have to know the epitope sequence yourself. And you know that if it's there, it will be identified by the um, immuno antibody that is present. You know what I'm saying? I'm not, you're not convinced? <laughs> like it's used in sequencing all the time. Huh? Do you, like, you don't use it in sequencing. You don't use Eliza in sequencing. Just as if it's there or not there. Eliza is basically detecting um, we do it a lot in the lab to detect whether a protein is going to be is going to have any immune activity. So we make we put the protein with the antibody, and if it binds, and then the antibody is labeled, and then you measure the absorption. So it can give you an idea of the quantity of how many of those epitopes are there, but not necessarily what structure they are. It's for identity. Okay, so with protein analysis, we have quantification, we have separation and purification, and then characterization 
and identification. Characterization of structure, structural characterization, and it could be functional characterization as well. Or bioactivity if we're talking about enzymes. And then we'll have we are in protein ingredient preparation. We will want to determine uh, purity of that ingredient. We determine the amount of protein there is. We will have to actually use separation amplification techniques to get to uh, to our product. And then we need to characterize looking at what happened to the protein structure once we isolated it. Did it denature? Is it still functional? Does it have high surface hydrophobicity, high surface um, hydrophilicity, net charge? So we characterize that protein that we have produced. So also, if we're just doing basic research, uh, such as what Lucy and Rachel are doing in the lab. So for example, Rachel is looking at a new protein, protein from pancreas. We know nothing about it. So in order to understand what that protein is or identify, it's, not identify, characterize the protein and find applications for it, we isolate it, we quantify, we characterize structure and function and compare it to other proteins in the market. Um, industrial application, I'll give you a lot of examples as to when we really need to quantify, separate, and characterize. I have a bunch of examples that I will show you in a minute. Okay. So the methods used should be obviously um, legal, when legal methods following regulations, nutritional, that means we have to make sure that you know, the protein that we have produced still has any nutritional value, uh, safe, no toxic components generated during the production, um, economical methods of separation in industry or quantification, and also uh, what are the functional implications that we care about. Okay, so there are several methods to measure quantity of protein, um, but why do we care? Yeah, nutrition. nutritional labeling, okay, determining nutrition and make putting that on the label. What else? Why do we care to measure, Kate? It impacts the Impacts flavor, texture, and color, definitely. Okay, what else? Hmm? So nutrition, uh, functional property investigation that can include texture, flavor, and color. Um, if we are looking at an enzyme, what's the biological activity of it, um, quality control. Sometimes you want to claim um, a certain amount of protein, so you want to measure to determine that you are meeting a certain uh, requirement. And sometimes it has to do with cost, so the higher protein content you have, the more you can uh, get for that product. When we purify a protein and fractionate it, we want to determine the yield, for example. So we want to determine how much protein we were able to, to recover. Um, when we're looking at functional properties, oftentimes you need to report per gram of protein. For example, if I'm looking at the emulsification capability of a protein ingredient, um, emulsification capacity, we learn uh, when, when, I met, when we talk about functionality, we learn that emulsification capacity is a measure of how much oil can be emulsified by one gram of protein. So we really need to know the exact amount of protein in our 
whatever test material so that we can determine the functionality per a gram of protein or per amount of certain protein. Um, if we're determining enzymatic activity, we also want to determine per amount of protein. So often when you buy an enzyme, um, it would tell you uh, how much activity it has per milligram of protein or per gram of protein. So there are many methods. These are the most common ones. So Keldal uh, is based on um, nitrogen analysis, and it is a chemical-based method. Dumas is based on nitrogen combustion. So you combust the sample into gases and then determine scrub off gases and determine the amount of nitrogen and convert that to protein. Um, IR, so like mid-IR and near-IR instrumentation that requires calibration. And then you would measure the amount of protein after you calibrate based on absorption of infrared um, radiation by different functional groups. Research methods, these are research methods because they're often done on a uh, kind of protein in solution that is uh, transparent, doesn't have any turbidity in it, and doesn't have any uh, complex components. So usually if we're purifying a protein and we want to determine how much protein was in our solution, we use one of these, um, these assays. So this is a table that summarizes the principle of each of the methods uh, or the common methods uh, used and uh, the sensitivity. And there is a document with references on Canvas in case you want to read more about, about this. This is beyond the, the, the cope um, or the capacity of this class to go through each method and explain what how it functions. So what is protein separation utilized for? We mentioned several of that. Production of protein ingredient. Um, purify a protein to identify and characterize, such as the example I gave earlier with, uh, with Rachel's work. Um, we take, we purify the protein and study it and determine its potential as a protein ingredient, looking at its structure, looking at its function. Um, we isolate sometimes after processing to determine the impact of processing on structure. And I'll give you more detailed ex uh, examples on that. So with protein separation, we rely on differences in proteins in order to separate them and isolate them um, and purify them. So proteins, we know that they differ in, in nutritional quality and they differ in functional properties. We don't rely on these differences to separate and isolate proteins. We rely on differences in biochemical characteristics. So with biochemical characteristics, what I mean is the solubility of the protein at different pH, at different salt concentration, in different solvents altogether, um, differences in thermal stability. Some proteins denature at higher temperature than others. Um, then we use thermal denaturation sometimes to isolate the protein by be, uh, heating to a particular temperature and precipitating the protein of interest. Separation based on size, charge, adsorption characteristics, that's where we use chromatography to separate, and also biological affinity to other molecules. When we use um, certain chromatography, like the, the affinity chromatography, So all of these characteristics are different among different proteins because of composition and differences in molecular structure. So again, here I show you the different examples. So 
Uh, here you have whey protein, beta lactoglobulin. Here's uh, soy protein, uh, glycinin, particularly one, one form of soy protein. Each of these is a subunit. Remember when I told you they form quaternary structures, soy proteins? They do. So here what you see is 12 different uh, peptides. So they have disulfide linkages, the red, hydrophobic interaction, hydrogen electrostatic interactions, as well as hydrogen bonding and electrostatic interactions. So if I want to break down the quaternary structure of the protein, I need to understand what type of interactions and how can I break them down if I need to separate and isolate one uh, form or one type of uh, subunit. Um, and then this is a globular protein, which is whey protein, it exists in a monomer form, and then this is the casein open structure. This denatures at 75 degrees C, for example, this denatures at, at more than 140 degrees C. So if I want to separate whey protein from casein, I can heat at 75. This will denature and polymerize and precipitate, so I can separate that globular protein from that open structure. And usually globular proteins denature at lower temperature than open structure. Because they have more of a structure that would be impacted by heat. Yeah? Is using like a way of thermal denaturation more damaging than like a solvent if you were to extract it like ethanol or something? Yeah, well, ethanol can be damaging too to the structure, right. organic solvent, so it can be damaging. Denaturation is definitely damaging and when we separate based on denaturation temperature is basically we are not going to be using it for functionality after that so what do they do in the industry it's thermal thermal stability separation based on heat is rarely done in industry it it's just here i'm explaining that it can be done to separate them but this is not an application that is done in industry The, okay, so what is, let's define denaturation, which is the topic of the next lecture later. But what's denaturation? What does it mean? You've heard of it many, huh? Unfolding. So denaturation is really, the, the, the heat is causing the protein to break some bonds within it, and it opens up. But this is an already opened up structure. Um, So the more structure you have, the more thermal impact it's going to have on that protein. The less of a structure, the less it's going to be impacted by thermal treatment. Okay. Okay, so there are, when we try to separate and isolate or purify a protein, there are several considerations. So, first of all, the nature of the matrix. So let's say we are starting with um, a high oil seed. So the first thing you want to do is to remove the interfering substance, which is the oil. So you want to think of ways to remove the oil with the least amount of impact on the protein. Um, in other cases, there's no oil. It's a crop that is high in fiber and starch. So what would be the best way to separate fiber and starch from the protein? So the, the food matrix impact how you're going to start your extractions. What would you be doing first? Would you be needing to remove the fat? Would you need to do air classification to remove as much of starch and fiber first and then um, purify your protein? So the matrix impact how you're going to do that. Quantity and degree of purity required. Okay, so 
uh, do I want to produce a concentrate or do I want to produce an isolate? So what is a concentrate and what is an isolate? So it depends on the protein uh, itself, the source of the protein. For example, in dairy, a protein concentrate can be 30 to 80% protein, whereas an isolate is 90% and higher. In soy protein, a concentrate is 65 to 80%, and an isolate is 90% and higher. In pea protein, a concentrate is 55 to 60%, 60-70%, and an isolate is 80% and higher. So it really depends on the source and um, then you the, the differentiation between concentrate and isolate. Why are the numbers different across each protein? Yeah, that, ask the industry. <laughs> well, because with, you can achieve um, a concentrate with soy protein that is 65 easier because you start with soy protein, it is, um, soy flour is what, 40% protein. Okay, when you defect the, the flakes, the soy flakes, you end up with 40%. So when you concentrate, you can get minimum of 65. If you do further purification, you can get minimum of 90, and that's how it, it came to be. Whereas in pea protein, for example, pea flour is only 20% protein. So it's very hard to reach an isolate uh, that is higher than 90% purity. So it really depends on the source and how easy it is you can, um, how easy it can get to a certain concentration of a protein. Um, stability of functional properties and biological activity. So again, here the stability, that's why we don't use thermal denaturation often to isolate, because you want to make sure that you have you don't hurt the protein functionality. If the protein is denatured, it's polymerized, it's not going to be soluble, it's not going to emulsify, it's not going to form a gel. So it's really important to consider methods of purification and isolation that will not damage the protein and will preserve as much of the functionality as possible. Another consideration is cost, how feasible it is. So for example, we in the lab, we look at different methods of extractions. One is commonly using pH extraction, another is using salt. Salt extraction results in a really good uh, protein in terms of structure and function. However, you use a lot of salt that the industry needs to remove that salt. So it takes a lot of water, it takes a lot of energy, um, and it's basically not feasible. So. Sometimes you have to not go for perfect, you have to go for most affordable uh, options. So you, there is a balance between uh, preserving functionality and production at a um, reasonable cost. So to monitor effectiveness of isolation, how do we do that? Just can you think of uh, ways that we monitor effectiveness of protein isolation, how effective it was. UV. Huh? UV. What? Measure UV absorbance. For what? Protein. So measuring content? Protein content? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, okay. But what do you do mostly, assess functionality, yes. Uh, what do you do mostly, Lucy, in the, in the lab right now? For quantification, yes. But what do you care for when you are isolating and comparing methods? Yes, yield, yes. <laughs> exactly, that's what you're spending a lot of time on. So we to monitor effectiveness of the method, we determine how much protein we were able to get in our final products. So measure total quantity. Determine yield, that means by mass balance, how much protein we had originally in our starting material, how much protein we collected, how much protein we've lost and we were not able to extract. 
Yield is very important because protein is money. The, more, the higher the yield, the more effective is your um, protein isolation. If we get only 40% of the protein out, then we are throwing away 60% of it. We're, we're potentially losing money. So yield is really important. Determining a method that gives me the best yield is really, really important. After we isolate, we look at protein composition and structure and look at its functionality or activity and compare it to other ingredients in the market. This table here summarizes, again, uh, different protein separation and purification approaches. There is a, on Canvas, there is a sheet with those references, one and two, where these, this information you can read more about. But basically, you start with extraction. Extraction can be done using solvents, um, so you are here extracting the protein based in its, on its solubility. So the first step is um, getting out protein as much as you can from your starting material. So you can solubilize the protein with at a particular pH where you know it has the highest solubility. You can uh, solubilize it in salt where you know that that particular salt concentration is going to solubilize most of your protein. But oftentimes, with that initial extraction, you are solubilizing protein, and there are still other solubles with it, like small sugars and salts, um, other components, or soluble fiber sometimes is in there as well. So you want to carry a further purification step. So it's not just I'm extracting the protein, but there are other components that is that coming with that protein, so I need to do a second step to purify that initial extract. So basically, extraction is your first step in your purification. And then after extraction, sometimes we precipitate. Uh, sometimes we use membrane filtration to concentrate. Sometimes we do an ultracentrifugation, or we purify by chromatography. So these are um, not necessarily, precipitation is not necessarily the first step of, the second step, I would say. <laughs> not necessarily first step of purification. So you have to have an extract first, and then you precipitate it um, out. Well, it depends. If you're doing, if you have milk, let's say, you can precipitate casein by uh, lowering the pH to 4.6 right away, and you can separate casein from whey. So it can be first step, I'm correcting myself, it can be first step, but it also can be second step. Um, so what I'm going to do is, tomorrow, is walk through each of the different ways we can extract, precipitate, talk about membrane filtration, centrifugation, and chromatography in more detail tomorrow. Okay, that's it. <laughs>